A lot was just announced at WWDC 25, and while everyone else's tech events sound like this, AI, AI, LLM, bomb, 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 Apple chose to go a different route this year. Don't get me wrong, this keynote had its fair share of AI-related features, but instead of spending two hours talking about large language models and how accurate they are, they had a more traditional approach and just focused more on useful features and updates, and for the most part, stayed away from buzzwords this year. On top of that, design-wise, there are some really neat things that I'm looking forward to, and some things that not a lot of people are talking about, and that's what we're getting into today. So with that said, let's get into it. This video is sponsored by ESR. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. So this year was a bit of a departure from last year's WWDC where Apple dove heavily into AI, which I think was somewhat of a necessity given that there's still controversy surrounding last year's event. There was supposed to be a smarter Siri with contextual awareness, which Apple did briefly address at the beginning of WWDC 25 saying that they're still working on it, but I think that sort of pushed this year's event into more of a traditional WWDC centered more around OS features. And it was such a nice break from hearing about AI agents and chatbots. There were no new products announced this year, which was a bit of a bummer, but every OS was gone over, all essentially with two things in common. One, they renamed every OS to fall in line with the year that they'd be used in, in this case 2026, so iOS 26, Mac OS 26, and so on. And two, they're all using Apple's new design language, Liquid Glass. Liquid Glass has translucent glass-like interface elements that refract light with specular highlights, where everything dynamically adapts between light and dark content on your screen. And the immediate reaction that I saw was this was like Windows Vista, but honestly, using this a bit myself, outside of the transparency aspect, this is nothing like Vista. On iOS specifically, it just seems to better utilize the space available where all the elements are more rounded and match the corner radius on the hardware. And things like tab bars and sidebars are positioned in a way where the focus is on the content you're looking at rather than the controls themselves. There's just a lot more thoughtfulness in terms of how everything works. There's also some other dynamic features with lock screens and wallpapers where the clock type face can dynamically adjust based on the content displayed. You can give photos in your library a 3D perspective that adjust as you move your phone, which by the way, they did update the photos app with some new UI to toggle between collections in your library, which I think a lot of people are gonna like and there's a new playback visualization for music. Now, all of this looks great and is super cool, and I know that there are already people complaining about the developer beta, but you've got to understand that this is the very first beta release, so there are going to be areas where things need to be improved, both design-wise and functionally. And to be honest, the functional stuff is what I find most exciting. But before we get into that, with this design refresh, it may also be time to refresh your accessories. And that's where ESR comes in. This ESR 3-in-1 charging station not only helps you keep a clean, clutter-free space, but it's also one of the fastest 15-watt MagSafe chargers out there. Charging to 80% on the iPhone 16 Pro, 99 minutes faster compared to other Qi 2 chargers. And can charge the Apple Watch Ultra four times faster than standard 2.5 watt chargers. A big part of why this works so well is ESR's CryoBoost technology, which works alongside iOS 26, actively keeping your phone cool to maintain that high speed charging, but it also increases the battery lifespan even during intensive use. On top of that, ESR's classic hybrid cases are fully compatible with these and other MagSafe accessories. Those will also be available on the iPhone 17 and feature camera guards that double a stance for watching content or gaming. And their magnetic strength is 1600 grams. That's over twice as strong as Apple's cases. Everything here is also Qi 2 and Apple certified, built for long-term reliability and ready for future iOS updates. So check out the link in the description if you're interested. Back to iOS 26 functionality, the phone app is gonna get a new call screening feature that automatically answers unknown calls and shares caller info before the phone rings, which I think could be super useful. 
I probably get more spam calls these days than important ones, and there's also a new hold assist feature that can detect when you're put on hold and keep your hold position for you without having to sit on your phone, which is nice. Messages is getting some new customizations like customizable backgrounds and features like chat bubbles and group messages or polls and Apple Cash added to help settle bills. I think that specifically will probably only work in the US. And speaking of cash, there were some new things with the Apple Wallet, where you can now add car keys and digital IDs. The only thing I'll say about that is you probably shouldn't use a digital ID at all due to privacy concerns, especially in this day and age. Handing your device over to someone else can lead to a whole bunch of data tracking and all sorts of things, so I'm less into those features, but there are some other cool things within the wallet, like this AI feature where it can identify and summarize payments outside of Apple Pay and pull those into order details that show up within the wallet. That really leads into some of the other AI features that were brought up, like in Maps, where iOS 26 will learn your preferred routes and will check your commute before you leave and give you any route information, like duration or delays, let you know of better alternative routes, and when you're in your car. All that new UI does extend to CarPlay, where you'll now have widgets and live activities. Visual intelligence is also being extended and added to the screenshot UI where you'll be able to search within the image and take actions across apps, extract event details on the screen, or ask ChatGPT about information within the image. It's sort of like a variation of circle to search on Android, but the exciting thing for me is that developers will have access to app intents for visual intelligence. So there is potential for some pretty neat things that might show up in here from third party devs and developers also get a foundations LLM model framework for using on device LLMs, which is going to be super fun to play around with and see what other people create with it. Outside that, there's a new gaming app that consolidates your gaming library in the Apple Arcade and whole experience into a centralized location and kind of moves Apple closer to having a more legitimate gaming experience. And there were some other things here and there, like live translations across messages and calls, but in large part, that's essentially what you can expect from iOS 26 this fall. When it comes to watchOS 26, there were a lot less things to note. Again, you can see some updated liquid design elements and some new features like the workout buddy, which is kind of like an AI motivational coach that's supposed to give you a pep talk based on your workout history. I know for me, unless that thing is swearing at me and calling me names, I probably won't find it useful, but the workout app itself was also updated with easy to access custom workouts and new suggested playlists or podcasts for your workout, which is kind of neat. There's also a new wrist flick gesture to dismiss notifications, mute calls, and close the smart stack. I'm really hoping for a booger flick gesture next year. Come on, Apple. We all want it. Right, guys? Right? The smart stack is also supposed to be more intuitive and provide you with more useful information. The messages app will provide better contextual reply suggestions, and your watch will apparently be able to sense things like ambient room noise and adjust the volume level of your watch for things like notifications, so they're not disruptive at all. Finally, the notes app is being added to watchOS, where you can view and capture things quickly, and as a whole, there feels like there may be some meaningful stuff there, but my guess is it will feel largely the same, and the same goes for tvOS. tvOS functionality is going to be largely the same, just with a facelift and that new liquid glass feel. I think that's fine, I really have no issues with tvOS in its current state, and the next big upgrade was with macOS 26, or Tahoe as it's called this year. Again, you're going to get those liquid glass elements and a refreshed design where the menu bar is now transparent. You can now change folder colors, tint icons, and there's just a lot more visual customization. Tahoe will also have some continuity or ecosystem updates that will show live activities that when clicked will open up iPhone mirroring. You'll also have access to a phone app where you can directly call people from your Mac that will have the same look and features as the phone app in iOS 26. 
The Shortcuts app is available with automatic triggers and Apple intelligence features, but probably my favorite thing that was shown were the updates to Spotlight, which will see its biggest update ever. In Spotlight, you'll be able to search just like you normally would, but you'll now be able to let it know what actions you'd like to perform within specific apps, you can access menu bar items from the app that you're in within Spotlight, which I think will be useful in apps that maybe you're not familiar with, or you don't know where specific functions are. And there's also quick keys, like typing SM for sending a message. And maybe the most useful here is there's now a clipboard history for accessing things that you've copied. Apple also said Spotlight will be contextually aware and be able to make suggestions in current apps or documents you might be working on. I am kind of curious about some of these contextually aware features because these are the same type of features that were delayed with Apple intelligence, but there's no coming later this year tag like there was last year, so I'm assuming that these will be ready out of the gate in the fall. Outside that, macOS is getting that same gaming app that iOS 26 is getting, and iPad 26 will see that as well, but I thought iPad OS was the highlight of the event iPadOS has historically just been a version of iOS with some updated features for the larger screen, which I think have taken away from the iPad's potential a bit. And while it is still based on iOS and you'll get pretty much all the same features you'll see in iOS 26, iPadOS 26 adds some pretty great new multitasking features. There's a brand new window system where you can fluidly resize windows. The pointer is supposed to be more responsive and precise and it's getting new macOS style controls with minimize and close buttons. There's a menu bar with labeled options. Preview is coming to iPadOS, and you can also set default apps for opening specific files. Honestly, this looks like it's finally getting a more usable UI that has a lot more potential to be a laptop replacement, but it doesn't stop with the UI. iPadOS will now run background tasks for complex work that will show up in the form of live activities, which is useful for apps like DaVinci Resolve when rendering videos. And you'll also get more advanced hardware controls where you can select specific input devices for microphones, Again, very similar to a desktop experience. There were some other mentions like advanced 3D graphing and some updates to the journal app, but those desktop features I think could make the biggest impact out of everything here. Finally, Vision OS got some updates as well, but I'm not sure how much of that is really worth noting. Liquid Glass was largely based on Vision OS, so I don't think that appears too much different, but there were some cool things like spatial widgets, where Vision OS will remember where you've placed them, which is neat, and some external accessory support being added, like PlayStation peripherals. But other than that, it was mostly small updates situated around spatial media and web components. All in all, I think there was a nice blend of actual features that had nothing to do with AI and then some that did contain AI. And I like that Apple just focused on the features themselves rather than trying to let us know that everything here is powered by Apple intelligence. I think stuff like that is somewhat unnecessary at this point and a lot of AI jargon gets lost on most folks, especially when we start getting into model accuracy and the specs around models and all that stuff. The real question that I have is how much of this stuff will be available on launch and if anything here will be delayed or by how much. With that said, drop a comment down below and let me know what you think about Apple's approach this year. Do you prefer more practical applications like this that maybe aren't as flashy or do you want to see more bleeding edge stuff being done? That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video or you found it useful. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me build a toaster that uses Apple intelligence to detect when you're having a bad day and automatically burns in motivational messages into your bread, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.